Hello everyone, my name is Robin. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about cold weather altimetry. I'm going to start with this graph right here. As you can see uh, on the left side, I have altitude from zero feet MSL, half the atmosphere, which is generally uh, known as 18,000 feet, and then all the way up to a very vague space. And across the bottom, I've got pressure from zero PSI, or zero inches of mercury, out to 14.7 or 29.92 which is standard day pressure. This is what an altimeter has built into it. It has a reference and it knows that 29.92 standard day that you will be at sea level, which is exactly what's indicated here. 29.92 gives me zero uh, MSL. If I go up to half the pressure, then I will indicate 18,000 feet. And if I have a zero PSI, that means I'm in space. So that's how the altimeter works, and it's either got this line built into it mechanically or electronically. Now the problem is the atmosphere isn't always that consistent, and we know that because we have the Colesman window where we can change the sea level pressure for any uh, particular uh, station. So we can slide this line, and it stays parallel, but we can slide this line left or right based on the sea level pressure, and then we can calibrate our altimeters based on the sea level pressure at that station. What I really want to focus on is the cold weather altimetry, and what we have is the atmosphere ends up more compact. So the true altitude where you actually indicate or are actually in space is at a much lower true altitude than what the altimeter is expecting. Okay, this is why we get these altimeter errors. Based on different temperatures, we get different slopes to this line. So on an uh, extremely cold day, the atmosphere is much more compact and at a much lower altitude, or the top of the atmosphere. And same thing, on a hot day, we could have it actually above this blue line. So just as an indication here, we have, let's just assume a minus 30 degree day, and that is the sea level equivalent temperature from standard. And we could end up with, then, at some of the higher altitudes, a pretty significant error of this amount. And again, I don't have any numbers off to the side, but you can see that it's a significant error. The altimeter is going to expect 18,000 feet based on a given pressure marked by my gray line here. But the true altitude is going to be considerably less than 18,000 feet. Now this yellow over here shows you the further you are away from the altimeter source, the greater the error. When we get in close down to marker altitude or decision height, those errors become much smaller. On a minus 30 degree day, for example, you might be at 200 feet decision height, you might have a 20 foot error. Now what happens when you get out to the other end, if you have an MEA of 12,000 feet or a grid mora of 12,000 feet, and you have a very cold day, let's say minus 30 degrees, you can end up with an altimeter error of 1,900 feet. So as we all know, in mountainous terrain, we're given 2,000 feet of terrain clearance with an MEA or a grid mora. In this case, your true altitude is going to be 1,900 feet lower, so you may actually have 100 feet. On this chart, what I want to show you is how a real-world situation would work out. Here we have the airport, and the blue indicates the charted altitudes from the IAF some intermediate altitudes down to the marker altitude. As I said, the errors are smaller the closer you are to the altimeter source. So you can see the error is relatively small, close in, but as we get all the way out here to the IAF for the holding pattern, the error can be rather dramatic. In this case, 450 feet would be the uh, correction. People always ask, how do we fit in with the other airlines and not cause a conflict because not all the airlines use this procedure of correcting the altitudes for cold weather altimetry. Well, obviously, we're most concerned about the terrain. 
So all we have to do, instead of adding 450 feet and telling air traffic control that that's what we're doing and confusing everyone in the stack above us, all we have to do is say, air traffic control, I will be unable 12,000 feet for my IAF, I'll be unable that. I would like to begin the approach at 13,000 feet. That will be my lowest altitude in the holding pattern. So we have given ourselves the terrain separation that we need. We fit in with all the other airplanes in the stack and we solved our problem because once we're cleared the approach from the IAF, we own the airspace from the IAF all the way to the airport. So the corrections that we make along the way, air traffic control won't care about. So it's the fitting in with the other airplanes at the different altitudes in the holding pattern. And if we just bump it up by a thousand feet, or if it's an extremely cold situation, you could bump it up by 2,000 feet, but just check the chart and you can come up with that number yourself. What I want to show you on this chart is how you can prove that this cold weather altimetry, and in fact, hot weather altimetry, actually does work. What we've got is the airport. We've got a fixed ground-based glide slope, which isn't going to change based on temperature or anything else. And we can have a marker or a DME fix which is the uh, glide slope intercept altitude, which is charted on our, uh, on our approaches. And if you're lucky enough to have the same altitude as a uh, vectoring altitude coming into the glide slope, this is the way you can prove it to yourself. If you come in at this altitude, that's the charted altitude, you're flying in here and it's a cold day, your true altitude, you're actually down here. So what will happen is you will come in at the charted altitude, indicating correctly. You will fly right through the marker or the DME fix, and you will go past it, and you will indicate low on glide path, and it may be a couple tenths of a mile before you actually get the glide slope centered and capture the glide slope. That's what happens on a cold day, and that's only 1,500 feet above the ground. So imagine that if you're 10,000 feet above the altimeter source. On a hot day, your true altitude is going to be up here. At that marker crossing altitude, you will intercept the glide slope, you'll start down the glide slope, and then you will actually cross the marker or that DME fix, and you will indicate a lower altitude than what you would expect or what is charted on the approach plate. This situation right here on the hot day is what I think was the cause of all the altitude bus on the civet arrival. I think it was called the civet arrival into LA. I haven't confirmed any of this, but I will bet you that most of those bus occurred during hot days in LA. People were capturing the glide slope. They were flying the glide slope down. And unfortunately, the charted altitudes at those points were based on a standard temperature day. So by being on a fixed ground reference on this glide slope, they were actually indicating low going by each of those fixes. So try this for yourself. I think you'll be surprised that during the summertime, it'll happen just this way. You'll cap capture the glide slope a couple tenths of a mile early and then cross the marker indicating slightly low. And in the wintertime, you will not have glide slope centered when you cross the marker, but it'll take a couple tenths of a mile past the marker before you get the glide slope centered. Remember, the higher you are from the altimeter source, the greater the error. So the worst case is a sea level airport with tall terrain around the airport. Remember that when you're in the airspace with other airplanes in the holding pattern, you're most concerned about the lowest altitude in that holding pattern. So just tell ATC you would like to bump the lowest altitude up by 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet if it's extremely cold, and just tell them that is the altitude you would like to begin your approach from. And finally, comply with the cold weather altimetry correction procedures for your carrier. And if you have any comments, I will post this on robinmaiden.com. If you'd like to contact me directly, email me at robinmaiden at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk again soon.